And we bring tonight a man who recently returned after a lengthy stay in the southern part of Africa, a Southern Californian who is a graduate of Stanford University. He even played football on the Stanford team when they called them the Indians. He is probably the most widely read conservative author today. He's written 104 articles for American Opinion, 140 articles for American Opinion magazine. And sometimes I think the magazine just wouldn't be the same if it weren't for an article by Gary Allen. He's written eight books. He's invaded, without permission, the backgrounds of the Rockefellers, of Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, and even Jimmy Carter before he was elected to the presidency of the United States of America. He will soon complete a new book called The Kennedy Capers. And I don't suppose we have to identify which Kennedys have been capering about lately. His none dare call it conspiracy has sold more than four million copies. He has marched with the rabble in Berkeley, and he's rubbed elbows with the elite in New York. And two weeks ago, ex returned to Southern California from that extensive trip in the southern part of Africa. His subject is South Africa, an outlook in South Africa, or as he likes to call his talk, Rhodesia Adio. All of us admire his great talent as a reporter and a writer, and by virtue of his dimensions, None dare call him anything but Sir Gary Allen. <laughs> Mr. Welch, council members, John Birch Society members, guests, Giving a formal speech is a totally new experience for me. Those of you who have attended any of my talks know that I normally use only a skimpy outline and talk mostly off the cuff. However, tonight I am restricted to precisely 20 minutes at which time Mr. Armour is going to push a button, and I will be summarily dispatched into the nether regions in the bowels of the Century Plaza Hotel. Because of these time limitations, I will tell all of my jokes in Joe Merton's room 607 at the party after the... That is after I turn Mr. Welch into the EPA for fouling the air here. <laughs> Don't laugh, you'll screw up the 20 minutes. Regretfully, I must also refrain from making any jokes about my boss, Scott Stanley, the world's greatest editor, corniest orator, and number one wine snob. St Scott Stanley is the only man I know who asks for the wine list at Pup and Taco. So there will be no remarks 
about pygmies, trolls, dwarfs, midgets, munchkins, leprechauns, or, even though we are so close to Hollywood, fairies. Unfortunately, the news that I bring back from Southern Africa is anything but pleasant. The biggest story of the past year comes from Rhodesia and is depressing in the extreme. Just one year ago, your reporter visited Rhodesia. At that time, terrorism was well under control. The terrorists were a problem only in the rural areas. Today, these activities have increased by a factor of 10, and terrorists are likely to strike almost anywhere. South Africa is now loaded with angry ex-Rhodesians who have reluctantly left their homeland, convinced that the situation there is hopeless. There is nothing you can do but shake your head and resist the temptation to cry as they tell their stories. These are magnificent, courageous people who have lost everything and for whom leaving Rhodesia was a wrenching experience. When the body of Rhodesia is sent to the coroner for an autopsy, it won't take Dr. Quincy to discover that the victim was murdered. And you won't have to be Charlie Chan to name the murderers. The names are Kissinger, Vance, Carter, Wilson, and Callahan. Fourteen years ago, Rhodesia made its unilateral declaration of independence from Great Britain in much the same fashion as we Americans made our declaration of independence on July 4th, 1776. Rhodesia opted for this course because England was demanding that the colony adopt black majority rule the equivalent of a demand by King George that the colonies of America accede to majority rule by the Indians. Since 24 out of 25 Rhodesians are black, and considering the treatment giving, given whites in other African nations where governments were turned over to black rule, Rhodesia's leaders felt they had no choice. Elsewhere, Great Britain had bid colonies which had desired independence a bon voyage. But in the case of Rhodesia, she led the world in placing economic sanctions on the newly independent country. Because of these sanctions, most nations refused to buy from or sell to the fledgling republic. Despite this, and with the help of South Africa, Rhodesia not only survived, but for many years prospered. Then in 1976, Henry Kissinger met with Rhodesian Prime Minister Ian Smith in Geneva and explained the facts of life of big-time power politics. Kissinger told Smith that the United States would see to it that Rhodesia's oil supplies were shut off if Smith did not agree to black majority rule. On the other hand, if the Rhodesian Premier agreed to do what he had solemnly promised his constituents he never would do, Kissinger would arrange to lift the sanctions. Those who have long followed Smith say that the man aged 10 years during that week in Geneva. Last fall, Ian Smith came to visit America. Obviously agonizing over his country's position, Smith pleaded that he had submitted to Kissinger's demands and that the U.S. had reneged on its half of the bargain. Now, however, black majority rule was not sufficient. Carter, Vance, and company, like Kissinger, closely tied to the Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission Complex, had simply upped the ante, demanding that Smith agree to bring into the government the very communist terrorists that Rhodesia had been fighting for a decade. This is the equivalent of asking Rhodesia to slash its own throat. The insiders clearly want a communist Rhodesia so that the pressure can then be put on the real target, neighboring South Africa. 
No reasonable person could expect the Rhodesians to bring the communist terrorists into the government without precipitating a bloodbath. Jimmy Carter knows this, and so do the brave people of Rhodesia. The alternative is economic strangulation supported by protracted terrorism. What is life like today in Rhodesia? In a word, grim. The backbone of that brave country has been its tremendously productive agricultural community, which is by far the most modern and advanced in Africa. Farming provides 50% of Rhodesia's gross national product. It is Rhodesia's agricultural exports which have allowed the country to survive over the past decade. Now, large, irrigated, highly mechanized farms are being abandoned by the hundreds as 85% of the nation is under effective control of the terrorists at nightfall. Rhodesia simply cannot survive as an economic unit without the foreign exchange earned by its agriculture. Ian Smith's acceptance of black majority rule and continuing demands by the United States and Britain that the terrorists of the so-called patriotic front be brought into the government have now convinced the terrorists that they are going to win. Blacks who were formerly on the fence are jumping onto what they see as the winning side. And believe me, in Africa, you don't want to be on the losing side of such a war. Farms there now resemble the frontier forts of our Old West. The gardens in the main house are surrounded by security fences, often up to 15 feet high. Many of them have additional security arrangements so that anyone who touches the fence will set off an alarm system. All have a series of arc lights within the security fences which are electronically controlled from the house. Many of the homes are surrounded by a trellis upon which ivy or bougainvillea are growing. On closer inspection, the trellis turns out to be steel mesh, always in direct line with the windows to deflect any rockets that might get through the security fence. Some farmers have a machine gun mounted on the roof in a turret. Around the outer limits of the security fences, other farmers have planted electronically controlled landmines, which can be set off from inside the farmhouse. There is no more sitting on the veranda in the cool of the evening, reflecting upon the hard work of the day as the houseboy brings a gin and tonic. When guests come or leave by the front gate, someone is there to cover the party with a submachine gun. At night, steel shutters are closed over the windows. Guard dogs are turned loose into the compound. The electrical systems are switched on, and the farmer and his family enjoy the evening amenities within the relative safety of their home. But always, automatic weapons are kept inches away, ready to be grabbed at the first unusual noise. This is Rhodesia for 5,800 farmers and their families. There's been nothing like it since the Indian Wars on the American frontier. Nobody tours the roads of Rhodesia now without an automatic weapon at his side. Brave women driving into town, smartly dressed for some social event, carry a Browning submachine gun across their laps. At the time of the interim agreement, Killings by terrorists were running about 180 per month. Now it is nearly a thousand per month. The atrocities are indescribable. Terrorists pry the eyes of their victims out with bayonets. Males are emasculated. Limbs are severed. And victims are often disemboweled. Sometimes wives are forced at gunpoint to consume some part of the flesh of their slaughtered husbands. These are the facts of life in Rhodesia today. The cities are not as dangerous as the rural areas, but are becoming more so. Terrorists blew up the oil storage facilities at Salisbury last December. General discouragement permeates Rhodesia after a decade of standing virtually alone. The English language press is controlled by a Rothschild frontman Harry Oppenheimer of South Africa, and has done much to undermine morale. 
Almost every family in Rhodesia has a relative or friend who has been killed or maimed in the war against terrorists who are financed by contributions from our National Council of Churches. Incidentally, the Salvation Army pulled out of the National Council of Churches, not wishing to be made murderers by proxy anymore. <laughs> After Encomo shot down the first of the Viscount airliners and the World Council of Churchills promptly gave him another $250,000 to keep on murdering people. Nearly 12,000 people are dead in this vicious war. Despite the fact that Rhodesian voters overwhelmingly supported the formula for creating a new black majority government, few have any illusions that it will work. Those who gave their approval by ballot simply saw no al other alternative at this advanced stage, while others looked at it as a measure for buying a little time while they prepare to leave the country. Most realize that the formula will lead to political chaos, observing that it is based on the same political premise used by the British in decolonizing other black territories in Africa, the system of a one-chamber legislature with a black majority, and paper guarantees for whites has never lasted more than 15 months in any African country. And where it lasted that long, in Zambia, the conditions of delivery were far more advantageous than in Rhodesia, with plenty of money and no terrorists in the bush. After 15 months, of course, Kenneth Kowanda opted for a one-party state and held a referendum that was rubber stamped by an ignorant black majority. Leaders of the white minority went to court charging that their constitutionally guaranteed rights had been violated. When they won, Kowanda simply replaced all the judges and did what he pleased. In other words, white Rhodesians are putting their trust in the hands of the so-called black moderate leaders. Bishop Abel Muzorewa, Reverend Nbangi Satoli, and Senator Chief Jeremiah Chirao. Muzarewa is widely respected in the Western press, but the bishop's credentials are about the equivalent of my own standing as a minister in the Universal Life Church. There is no such thing as a bishop in the Methodist Church of Rhodesia or Europe. The title is honorary. Years ago, the African nationalists discovered that they could gain standing with the World Council of Churches by calling themselves reverend. There are literally thousands of men in the so-called black liberation movement who sport that title. Many of them have never opened a Bible, and a large number of them couldn't read it if they did. Bishop Muzarewa was a terrorist wanted for murder who was brought back into a leadership position by the Kissinger Agreement. A photograph of him has recently been run in almost every newspaper in southern Africa with a hand grenade in one hand and an AK-47 machine gun in the other. Muzarewa is favored to win the April 19th elections, but is not regarded as tough enough to hold on once the infighting begins. The Reverend Satoli, again the Reverend is honorary, was a terrorist leader who has been photographed in a Mao Zedong uniform being given the royal tour of Red China. Many of Satoli's lieutenants have also been to the People's Republic of China for training in guerrilla warfare. Keep in mind that Bishop Muzarewa and Reverend Satoli are the leaders of the moderates. Senator Chief Chirao has been backed by internal financial interests, which he is in turn double-crossed. He is the one who is ostensibly pro-Western and anti-communist, and he is in way over his head. Chirao, I am told, is an example of the Peter Principle in action. Then there are the avowed terrorists, Mugabe and Nkomo. And let me insert right here that Rhodesians violently object to these people being called guerrillas. Guerrillas, they note, are irregular soldiers who attack military targets only. In southern Africa, one is dealing exclusively with terrorists who only attack civilian targets. And the vast majority of their victims 
are defenseless blacks. Terrorist leader Robert Mugabe was educated in the mission schools where most black nationalists learn to hate whites, and he is a doctrinaire Marxist. According to Rhodesian sources, he commands 25,000 troops in Mozambique and another 8,000 terrorists within Rhodesia. Like the other black leaders we have mentioned, Mugabe is a member of the Mashona tribe. His rival is Joshua Nkomo. Nkomo, whose terrorists have now shot down two Viscount airliners loaded with civilian passengers, shares the leadership of the Patriotic Front with Mugabe. Nkomo is a Metabili, an offshoot of the warlike Zulus. Less a doctrinaire Marxist than Mugabe, and Como is a bloodthirsty thug who means to be dictator. He commands 12,000 troops in Zambia and an additional 2,000 terrorists inside Rhodesia. Under black rule, Rhodesia will return to tribal warfare. The Mashonas get along with the Metabiles like snakes with mongoose. The Mashonas have a four to one numerical advantage, but the Zulu related Metabili are tougher and better fighters. Because of their numerical inferiority, almost all Menabili are now supporting Nkomo because they fear for their lives under a Mashona-dominated government. Mashona support is divided among Bishop Muzarewa, the Reverend Satoli, and Mugabe. When the European settlers first arrived at the turn of the century, the Mashona and Menabili were helping disease to keep the population down to about 300,000 by merrily butchering each other. The English established hospitals for the indigenous population and stopped the tribal slaughter. As a result, the population of the two tribes has today jumped from 300,000 to 6 million. When European control is ended, the clock will be turned back 80 years. Tribalism is alive and well in Africa. There is zero chance of both tribes peacefully ruling what will be called Zimbabwe with a permanent coalition. That is, unless the Soviets or Cubans replace the European Rhodesians and maintain order among the tribes. Rhodesia's whites are expressing their lack of confidence in the future by voting with their feet. When Kissinger shoved his plan for a black majority rule down Ian Smith's throat two years ago, there were 278,000 Europeans in Rhodesia. Now one-third have immigrated, and the escape is escalating. The official figures for last December cited 2,700 immigrations. Unofficially, 8,000 of Rhodesia's remaining 180,000 Europeans left during that one month. The discrepancy is explained by the fact that an immigrating family can only take $1,000 out of the country. But those going on vacation, or holiday as they call it over there, are allowed to take $400 per person with them. So many large families leave on holiday and never return. Imagine a family walking away from a lifetime of work at building a farm or a business and being glad to have escaped with only $1,000. Worse off are the whites who are stuck in Rhodesia. A young man can start over, no matter how much he is left behind, but the elderly cannot. And they stay on in the hope that they won't be evicted. They are dreaming. They will be slaughtered. The current bitter joke making the rounds of the country is that the definition of a patriotic Rhodesian is someone who can't afford to leave. What are the implications for South Africa when the People's Soviet Republic of Zimbabwe is created in a couple of years? A communist takeover of Rhodesia will complete the saddle of red nations over the top of South Africa. In addition to Rhodesia, these will include Angola, Mozambique, Botswana, and Lesotho. Sparsely populated South Africa will have thousands of miles of border to deliver, pardon me, to defend, and the war will be on. American Baptists, Methodists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and other members of the National Council of Churches who have been financing the butchering of black and white Rhodesians while their simpering jellyfish ministers keep their mouths shut 
have a big surprise in store for themselves. While these moral eunuchs and wizards of weasel words think nothing of paying for the slaughtering of Africans, they are going to be singing a different refrain when as a result of what they have done, their own sons, and by that time probably daughters, will be sent into a no-win war in Africa a few years hence. When that happens, I personally intend to dispatch one of these sniveling cowards to a higher authority to explain his cowardice. The scenario is this. In about 1982, America will suffer a depression. Within a year or two, President Teddy Kennedy will be looking for a way out of the depression. As have his predecessors, he will turn to war in an attempt to solve the depression. Obviously, we can't go back to Southeast Asia. We've done that gig. South America would be too difficult for the Soviets to supply. There is very little room to fight a war in Europe besides the properties of a large number of multinational corporations would be destroyed. That leaves jungles of Africa as the most logical choice for a long, protracted, no-win war. Kennedy will go to South Africa and volunteer American lives to get the Soviets off their back after we put them there in the first place. Of course, Kennedy will explain, since half of the American military is black, they cannot be expected to fight for a racially segregated South Africa. The quid pro quo will be that South Africa will have to surrender to black majority rule in their country where Europeans are outnumbered five to one. If the South Africans accept this offer, it will mean the end of civilization in that country, as is meant the termination of civilization in a dozen other African nations where people are now reduced to eating rats, snails, and monkeys to keep from starving to death. If South Africa accepts Kennedy's offer, American boys and girls will pay with their blood for the moral cowardice of their parents and their spineless ministers. Rhodesian blood will ironically be avenged by the spilling of American. Thank you very much.